Alan Cooley was a popular character actor that starred in many silent films in the 19-teens and 20s and easily transitioned to the talkies. But by 1933, he was retired from acting. Why? Join me as I investigate. Before I begin, I must thank film historian Kevin Charbonneau for providing me with his excellent biography on Alan Cooley that proved invaluable as a source. Charbonneau, who has worked in theater and film management, distribution, and design, has been researching and writing about film history since 1987 and has been published in Silent Film Quarterly and Classic Images. Be on the lookout for his future biography on Al Jennings. Hallam Cooley was born in Brooklyn in 1895 as Lindsley Hallam Burr, apparently a descendant of Aaron Burr. According to an interview with Moving Picture World in 1919, Hallam's mother left his father, George Burr, when he was a baby and never told him his real surname. I'm assuming she changed it to Cooley. He didn't find out that that was his name until years later. He often went by the shortened nickname Hal. There's not a lot of other information available about his childhood, but Charbonneau and other historians have found that Hallam apparently attended Northwestern Military and Naval Academy in Highland Park, Illinois for high school. Hal himself told this story to Motion Picture Classic in 1920. In an interview when she states that after he graduated high school, he moved to Yuma where he worked as a waiter. He then journeyed to Calexico, California, where he apparently joined the Calexico Border Army and worked briefly as a cook with them before working various odd jobs that eventually led him to Los Angeles, where he found work in motion pictures. Since he made his first movie in 1913 at the age of 18, it's not clear how much of this traveling man story was embellished for his interview, but Charbonneau was able to find that Hal did perform on the stage in various stock theaters and such plays as Kingdom of Hearts Content before he entered films in 1913. That year, he made his motion picture debut at Fidograph and Just Show People, a short drama in which he supported Leo Delaney and Norma Talmadge. But since Hal did not make another film for another two years, he could have done some of these other adventures during that time period. In 1915, Hal appears to have signed briefly at Universal, making eight comedy shorts there over the next year, including the Arthur series in which he played the best friend to Rupert Julian's title character. According to Daniel Bloom, he also worked at Signal Studios. In 1916, Hallam had his first starring role in The Daughter of the Dawn at Arrow Film Corporation before making several more comedy shorts at Rex, Triangle, and Keystone over the next few years. Between 1917 and 1920, he began to co-star more feature-length films at Universal, Triangle, and Goldwyn. Highlights include The Deciding Kiss in 1918, in which he was the male lead to Edith Roberts, The Girl Dodger in 1919, in which he supported Charles Ray, Happy Though Mary, 1919, in which he starred alongside Eden Bennett and Douglas MacLean. Pinto, 1920, in which he starred alongside Mabel Normand. And Trumpet Island, 1920, in which he supported Marguerite de Lamont and Wallace MacDonald. Moving into the 20s, Howe enjoyed a successful decade as a popular actor that could easily move between starring and leading and supporting roles. Since he was such a good character actor, he was hardly ever pigeonholed or typecast, demonstrating a large range of versatility. However, there were a few niches that he often fell into, including the cocky rich dandy that made a play for the leading lady and sometimes found himself inebriated. He played various manifest manifestations of this character several times, but each time the character was different, showing the extra something that Hal put into carefully constructing his characters. Examples include the 1921 Lois Weber film, What Do Men Want?, which saw him as the lecherous Yost out to seduce Claire Windsor's Hallie. Another version of this character appeared opposite Marion Davies in 1922's Beauty's Worth, this time named Henry, a rich dandy who tries to humiliate the poor prudence played by Marion. In 1923, Hal got the opportunity to play another type of character, this time the best friend of Douglas MacLean and Going Up, which appears to have been a commercial and critical hit. The New York Times praised both actors and said, Hallam Cooley is very efficient as Street's friend. Hopkins and Brown. These two really get away from the ordinary motion picture acting, and they seem quite natural, actually moved to mirth themselves by the story of the farce. Hal starred alongside McLean again in the successful 1924 comedy Never Say Die, which was also a critical hit. In 1925, Hal starred in the MGM horror comedy The Monster, this time as yet another different type of character. The successful quote-unquote He-Man rival to meek Johnny Arthur in the lovely Gertrude Olmsted's affections. The trio find themselves in Lon Chaney's haunted house where several comedic situations ensue, often involving Hal attempting to save today as the hero. 
Although Hal was playing the hero type character here, he was actually the villain to the protagonist, Johnny Arthur. He was so good at playing these types of villainous roles that Motion Picture Magazine said in 1925, there is one actor in Hollywood who occasionally does villain parts that stand by themselves, Hallam Cooley. His villainy is tossed off with gay, debonair indifference. You can never help having a sneaking liking for him. Also in 1925, Hal starred in a series of Married Life comedy shorts at Fox alongside Catherine Perry, in which they played a hilarious bickering married couple named Helen and Warren. He also went to B.P. Schulberg's preferred pictures to star as another debonair villain, villain, this time alongside Clara Bow and Free to Love, as a grifter that tries to lure an innocent girl, played by Bow, into joining him in a life of crime. In 1927, Hal played a more sympathetic character, a reporter that helps out and later comes to the rescue of Cal Colleen Moore's Mary Lou and her wild oat at First National, which got him good notices in the New York Times. He also starred alongside Nancy Carroll in her film debut, Ladies Must Dress, that same year. In 1928, Hal effortlessly made the transition to talking pictures at Warner Brothers and The Little Wildcat, a part talkie that also starred Audrey Ferris and James Murray. 1929 saw Hal star in eight talkies at Warner Brothers and Pathé. Highlights included the May McAvoy comedy Stolen Kisses, which saw him labeled as the male lead in Exhibitor's Herald, Wedding Rings, in which he starred alongside Olive Borden, and the surviving Paris Bound, which saw him support Anne Harding and Frederick March as a hilarious drunk friend that often puts his foot in his mouth at the wrong time. Hal entered the 1930s still starring in talkies. First, he starred alongside Corinne Griffith, Grant Withers, and Montague Love in back pay as a smooth-talking traveling salesman that convinces small-town Hester, played by Corinne, to hit the road with him. Hal also supported Anne Harding, Robert Ames, and Mary Astor in Holiday, playing the stuffed shirt Seton Cram, memorably killing the buzz at a lively private party that Anne's Linda desperately needed. He also made a memorable appearance as Mr. D. Quincy Throckmorton, a rich man that finds himself in the wrong place at the wrong time in the Ted Healy and Three Stooges comedy Soup to Nuts. In 1931, Hal began to slow down with his acting career. More about this in a minute. His last major role on the screen was in Frisco Jenny in 1932, in which he supported Ruth Chatterton as Willie Gleason, another drunken lounge, lounge lizard type of role. Following this film, Howe only acted twice, appearing in bit parts in 1934's Little Man, What Now? and 1936's Mary of Scotland. But he was not out of the entertainment business altogether. According to Charbonneau, Howe became an agent in 1936, representing several actors in Hollywood at various agencies before eventually forming his own Hallam Cooley agency sometime in the 1940s. Charbonneau was able to find a billboard from 1946 that advertised Hal's agency with the catchphrase, Got a script to sell? Along with his agent work, Hal was also heavily involved with real estate for many years going back to the 20s. Charbonneau was also able to find articles that discussed Hal's work in building and buying houses and then selling them through his organization, Hal Cooley Incorporated. He appears to have dabbled in this business into the 1930s alongside his agent work. I also found an article from 1929 that listed real estate work being the reason Hal's career was slowing down a bit on the screen when he was going into acting in the 30s. Also according to Charbonneau, Hal married for the fourth time in 1935 to Doris McMahon, and the two enjoyed entertaining and being a part of Hollywood and Palm Springs society into the 1950s. Following Doris's death in 1961, Hal married his fifth wife, Charlotte Misamore, whom he later, I'm sorry, whom he happily remained married to until his death at the age of 76 in 1971. So we are left with the question, why did Hal Cooley retire so early on in the talkies? Well, we seem to have that answer. He wanted to concentrate on his real estate career and his newly developed interest in becoming an agent. I have a feeling that had he wanted to, he could have been successful for years to come as a character actor into his old age. Hal Cooley was a rare type of successful character actor that crossed over from supporting territory into major leading roles. He could play anything from heroic leading men to wisecracking friends to debonair villains to drunken rich dandies. While a lot of studios used him most often as a rich dandy, Hal refused to be pigeonholed and constructed different nuanced characters for every film. He was a true talent that more people should know about today. While several of his films are lost, as is the case with most silent stars, sadly, we are fortunate to have the ones that we do. I suggest checking out The Monster, Free to Love, and Holiday on YouTube. You can also purchase Backpay on DVD from Amazon. Here's to you, Hal Cooley, for being such a wonderful actor. Please like this video and subscribe or follow this account if you want to learn more about the history of silent film stars who starred on Lust and only briefly in the talkies. 
Thank you again, Kevin Charbonneau, for your valuable, wonderful biography about Hal Coley. That was a wonderful source to have when I made this video. Up next, join me as I cover the silent, talky career of Helen Chandler. Thank you so much for joining me. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.